All right, my name is Jason from So The Land and in today's video, I'm talking to somebody that has inspired me uh, on our homesteading journey. Uh, you may know him from uh, the Permaculture Voices podcast, Diego Footer. He's a podcast host and he does uh, Permaculture Voices podcast, Grass-Fed Life podcast, which I was on a couple years ago, and uh, the Farm Small, Farm Smart podcast. And he also started uh, the Paper Pot Company. And since we are in uh, Southern California, I drove out to where he's at near San Diego and to ask him some questions, some questions that I've been always wanting to ask him. And I'm happy to share our conversation with you all. All right, Diego, we're, we're, uh, what are we making here? All right, today we're gonna make <laughs> biochar, but really we're gonna be making charcoal that will eventually become biochar. We're gonna make it an easy way, a DIY way that really anybody can do anywhere. There's a lot of ways to make biochar. I think this is a simple way to at least get started and get into biochar without getting too scientific. All right, so we got here just a normal wash drum. You can find these on Craigslist. I pulled this out of an old washer and dryer that I had. The one nice thing about these is they're really heavy duty metal. It's a perfect shape for having a fire in. And it's also got all these holes in it which allow a lot of air to come through. When I make biochar, one thing I like to do is stack function. So this is back here in my chicken area, in my garden area for a reason, because I can start this fire, do work in the garden and then just let this burn on its own. Once I get it started, it can be self-sustaining. I'm just throwing wood on it every once in a while. I think that's a lot easier than having to just sit by a fire for an hour and a half. Now that's great if you wanna chill, but I don't always have time to do that. So it's back here near the garden, so it makes while I work. One thing I like to do when I start is, there's obviously gonna be heat coming off the bottom of this ring, and I get a lot of like leaf fall and stuff like that. There's all these, things that come out of the ash tree, these little seeds. A lot of times I'll just rake wood chips and anything else I can find to go underneath the fire pit because that's all gonna turn into biochar as well, really fine biochar. And I might as well have the bottom working while the top is working. So it's trapped under there. The heat under there is actually gonna turn all that into char. Next step is just gonna be start the fire. All right, today I'm in Southern California uh, and I'm with Diego and somebody that has inspired me in, in my homesteading journey. So happy to be here, man. Yeah, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. He drove a long ways today <laughs> to come and it, it's cool to have people who've listened and learned come out to see me. So uh, I'm grateful for him. So thank yeah. Jason for doing this. So you do a podcast. So how'd you get started doing that? You know, I, I listened to a lot of podcasts back in 2013 is when I actually started the podcast. And at that time I was kind of thinking, oh, I should do this. I should do this. And I decided to, I'm going to partner with somebody who had their own podcast and maybe I could do some guest episodes with them. And then along the way I thought, no, I'm just going to do it myself. So I kind of dove in just like, I think you dove into vlogging and yeah. you know, your podcast yeah. and one day decided to do it. At that time I was big into permaculture. I was doing the permaculture voices conference. So a lot of that material on the early days of the podcast was permaculture based. Right. Since then it's just evolved as I've evolved. The podcast is really, you know, my journey. People are often ask, why don't you do permaculture podcasts anymore? And so I'm not, focused as much on that. I don't not like it. It's just not as big of a part of my life. And I'm trying to make the podcast integrate more to what I do on a day to day. Mm -hmm. And I'm also just trying to tell really good stories is, is kind of where I've gone, where initially I think a lot of it was content driven. Now I try and go a lot of story driven, tell the stories of people, how they make a living, why they have big changes in their life, those types of things. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna start this just like you would a campfire. I like newspaper twist it up, allows it to burn a lot longer. And then I'm just gonna start by just laying twigs on it. Again, like you would a campfire. And then we'll gradually put bigger and bigger pieces on. This is all stuff I just collect around the property. So gradually working up just to bigger size pieces. And a lot of what I'm putting on here, this is just pallet wood. I get a lot of pallets through Paper Pot, the business I run, and my way of recycling these is taking them from pallets, turning them into biochar, 
because I don't do a lot of outbound freight shipping on the pallets. The other main way that I get wood is just from tree trimmings. I've kind of gone away from chipping all my tree trimmings and I keep anything that's big enough and burnable, turn it into biochar, all the smaller finds go into the green can. Why have I gotten rid of chipping? It's just so dry out here. I don't know that mulch, wood mulch, wood chips provide a huge benefit once you have an initial layer down. I have layers out there that have been there for two years and some of the sticks on top look exactly like they did when they were put there two years ago. So I'm kind of have everything mulched. It doesn't benefit me to make more. So I might as well turn it into a stable form of carbon, put it in the soil where it's gonna benefit forever. You know, I remember sitting in my office uh, prior to moving to North Carolina and I would listen to a lot of your podcast. And that would just inspire me and be like, man, like these people are farming and hearing all those stories and stuff. And so, you know, after you've been talking to so many people, do you ever feel like you wanna go start a farm or homestead or live in more acres or something like that? I did. I mean, that was definitely the curve. When I first started doing this, you, you talk to so many awesome people from you know, Curtis Stone, who's doing small stuff urban farming at the time, to Mark Shepard, who's doing agroforestry and silvopasture on massive acreage, to Jeff Lawton, who's doing really cool stuff with permaculture. I mean, like, I, I fell in love with the visual, the aesthetic, and like the dream of like, that's what I want. So then, yeah, I mean, that was my goal. Like initially even like, there was some plan to do like some sort of market gardening back here. But then, you know, life changed, life evolved. I have three kids. I didn't have any kids when I started the podcast or and I would, my first daughter would have been, no, just about a year. I would have one kid then. I now I have three. I'm married. I, I have a business now that I didn't have then. I do a couple podcasts now. I do YouTube now, which I didn't do then. So life definitely evolved. Along with that, I just had this somewhere along the way, I kind of let go of some of these ideas and dreams and aspirations. I traveled through the Midwest about two years ago. I saw how cheap land was. I saw how much land you could get. I visited <laughs> some beautiful farms right. in Ohio and Indiana, and I thought, wow, this is amazing. I could sell my house in California and buy 100 acres and a house there. But then I started to think, you know, like, what am I going to do with all that land? Do I really want that or does just part of me want it like I might want the new iPhone or a new set of headphones? And that's really what it was. It was like, the idea sounds cool. It's so like being romantic about it almost. It, it was, <laughs> yeah, like this, the servicey, like, you know, it's the, humans have this gut response to like something like, ah, I want it. Yeah. But then you don't think about like, when you get it, what is life actually gonna be like? So when I started to think about that, well, I didn't want to raise livestock. I didn't want to really do the homesteading thing all on. I have this business I need to run. How am I going to run that from there? It would present challenges. I'd move away from some of the family that I have out here, which you know you did, which you said was hard. Yeah. And I just decided like those things aren't the most important thing in my life. I need to focus on what's most important for me. And, and one other big consideration I see when anybody wants to do homesteading or farming is if I move to a brand new piece of land, there's gonna be a lot of work to set that up, yeah. to get started. And yeah, I can have my daughters involved, but if you wanna do some serious work fast, like typically kids can't be involved. Right. Like, you just can't work at the same speed. So I didn't wanna miss them growing up while I worked out on some sort of land and set it up. So I'm just happy where I'm at. I'm, I'm fairly remote here, yet close to stuff in San Diego. Yeah. So I like where I am. And I'm enjoying it. I, I have kind of gone past of like looking for what's next or what's on the horizon or aspiring to to do more. It's it's just taking some time now really for me in my life and saying, I've done a lot. What do I really love? Where do I want to be? And I want to get the most out of that. <laughs> and I can vicariously live the homesteading life by watching your YouTube channel, right. watching other you know homesteaders out there. And I can go visit places like yeah. you and see them that way. And I think, honestly, like that's enough. Like I don't eat a lot of ice cream, but occasionally right. if we go to a good ice cream shop, you know, I'll get an ice cream, you right. know, four or five times a year. 
that little lick, that taste, yeah. like that's enough to quench my hunger for ice cream. <laughs> and it's like I can go visit some of these places and say, all right, yeah. That's great. I was in the Midwest. I experienced it. <laughs> I I'm went to done. his farm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready to go home and <laughs> right. do my thing. I don't need to be on a lot of land like I initially thought I did, or I don't need to have a food forest like I thought I did. That wasn't what was going to make me happy. What was, what makes me happy and what always would have made me happy is doing what I loved. And if building the food forest was that thing, then I would do that. It's not the food for us, it's the act of building it. But yeah. now it's like, I found my place. I'm happy spending time with my kids. I'm happy just hanging out, doing a little bit of gardening here. That's what I enjoy. I don't need more. So the idea here is you want to burn this at a high temperature really fast. Because you're not trying to make a lot of ash. So you're going to use bigger wood. And so now you started your own, is it uh, farm? Farm Tools is a paper pot company, right? Yep. And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so Paper Pot Co. is a company that I started with Curtis Stone back in April of 2017. So we're almost three years old now. The idea there was to get tools for small market farmers, vegetable growers, and we're even looking at, you know, into gardening scale, tools to make life easier, mm -hmm. make life better. A lot of the tools we have, they're labor saving, they're time saving, they, they save some wear and tear on your body. So us putting those tools out there, I, I think is helping a lot of farmers and it's also enabling me to do things like the Farm Small, Farm Smart podcast I do where I can talk to a lot of farmers. And you were just up at the Heirloom Expo talking yep. about how the Gettles, Jerry Gettle started Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. And now he uses that company as a, as a tool to enact some change in the world. So he has homesteaders come out. He, he throws the Heirloom Expo, has it at a really reasonable price. Right. And I look at the business that I'm doing too. You know, We sell tools, but how can we use those tools to innovate new tools to make people's lives easier? How can we use those tools to tell stories? Uh, we'd like to do things like give grants to or scholarships, um, you know, fund future farms. So that's that's where we're going with things. Right, right. Here's where we're at now. We've probably been burning for an hour and a half. There's no nothing special on the time of length here, but I'm looking for basically everything to be burnt so there's no solid chunks of wood. And I can test that by just putting a shovel in and any of the big pieces of char should just kind of break apart. So now it's all about uniform size, and this is where I'm gonna stop it at this stage. One thing I like to do before to help reduce particle size for later introducing it into the soil is I just go through with a shovel and I just kind of chop it. So really just soak it, because I want to put the fire out instantly all over. The bottom of this tub has holes in it. So all this water just drains out. Some people would say this isn't maybe optimum for a burn. Is it, it, but with, when you make biochar getting into the technicals, temperature can have some effect on the final product. And a different shape kiln would create, would allow higher temperatures. But this is DIY, pretty easy. It's an easy way to get started. I like to just chop it up with a shovel. Other people will run it over with a car do all sorts of things to mash it up. I think this works fine. I'm not worried about getting this down to a fine, fine particle size like flour or rice or even like uh, Cheerios. This can stay anywhere from the Cheerio stage up through Jolly Ranchers, anywhere in there. It's all gonna go right into the soil eventually after it goes through compost and I figure it's gonna get broken up further in the soil when shovels go in it, when rakes go across it, walking on it. So. I'm not going to waste a lot of time reducing particle size to something very fine. I don't know how many podcasts have you had so far through the years, but like, was there any like certain podcasts that, that really resonated with you, like, like really inspired you and that, that you really loved? Or is it all kind of like all together that you really like? Yeah, I mean, I've probably done over 600 interviews <laughs> wow. and there's probably a thousand <laughs> podcast episodes. Nice out there. Are there any that really stand out? I mean, I'm going to be recency biased here. <laughs> and this is the only way to really filter through that set of, of 600 interviews is this summer I spent a lot of time working on a podcast actually for someone else. Like they had me 
host the podcast and I talk to a lot of conventional farmers who are very different than the mm. farmers that I talk to for the shows that I do. So think Midwest based, corn and soy, large scale. And I always knew what they did was really important, but I think I was always had in my mind this idea of, I don't know that that's totally sustainable or the best way to do things. And doing about 10 of these interviews over the past few months really changed my perspective on large scale farming and how important it is, the challenges they face, the struggles they face, and the fact that like they're people too. Yeah. Like they're the same as you. They just want to do what they think they can do best, provide for their family, and have fun doing it. And that's what they're doing. People watching may not agree with some of the tools and techniques that they use, and I think that's fine, and I think they're okay with that. But I think there's a lot of victimization or uh, a lot of accusation towards these farmers of like, you know, you're ruining the earth or you shouldn't be doing this without really understanding their point of view. Right. And so a takeaway from that and a lot of the interviews is, is everybody has a story. Like there's a reason why everybody's doing what they're doing. And it's one thing to take a snapshot image of why somebody's doing something and say, hmm, I'm going to judge you based on that snapshot without getting to know the why. Right. And, and there's so many stories there that, that tell the context of, well, here's why I do it. You know, we're a five generation farm. We've done it this way. And you think about the power of a legacy like that. How do you walk away from that? Yeah. You know, when it's literally in your blood, it's part of, you know, your culture, your name. So, so that stands out to me it is everybody has a story. There's always unique stories. I think talking to people, I mean, who, what, who viewers might relate to, Justin Rhodes is somebody who he emailed me before he did his permaculture chickens video and was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing something like a Kickstarter and making a video. Here, here's a video that I'm thinking about doing. Like, how did you get people to participate in what you were doing? And we emailed back and forth a few times before mm -hmm. he started his video. So he was like a lot of people just kind of sitting around saying, what can I do? What can I do? I want to participate here. And to see his evolution to go on to make that Kickstarter be successful and then start a YouTube channel. And he came out to PV3, I think at the time he only had about 8,000 subscribers mm -hmm. on his YouTube. And today he's maybe, I don't know, 500,000? Yeah, above that, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> plus 500,000. And he, it's obvious that he's doing something that he loves. Like he, he fits really well in that role. So he's one that stands out. And I talked to a woman that overcame cancer and I know you have a cancer story mm -hmm. and how she worked through that a conventional way with chemo and then she did alternative treatment using the Gerson therapy and her name was Marianne West. Her story was really inspiring. I mean, there's just no end to it. It's, I don't wanna be disrespectful to anybody to say like, I'm not picking your story. I just can't <laughs> remember them all. There's, yeah. there's so many, but the core is there's amazing stories in everybody and I agree, yeah. I'm lucky to have gotten to participate in, in the telling of some of those stories. So tell us all the, um, so you have a couple podcasts going on right now? Yeah, right now I do two official podcasts. Uh, Grass-Fed Life, which focuses on livestock, and that's actually a podcast that you've been on yep. in the yep. past as part of a collaborative episode. And I'm winding that down probably by the end of the year that won't be around anymore or new episodes won't be coming anymore. The archives will still be available, 180, 150 plus episodes there all on livestock. That's just the time thing. I'm getting super busy. My daughters are getting older. <laughs> they take up a lot of time. I, I can't do it all. Yeah. And then my main podcast, which ties into Paper Pot Co is Farm Small, Farm Smart. And what I do on that is talk to a lot of small scale farmers uh, about how they started their market garden, how they're making market gardens better, advancements in that space. I'm talking to a seed breeder this year, a lot of topics on soil, really veg centric. And that has 180 episodes now. At the end of this year, there'll be you know over 200. So a, a big wow. archive there. And then Permaculture Voices is the other one that I started mm -hmm. that had maybe about 250 episodes that okay. people can view 
nothing new is being put on it, yeah. but it's out there. And then you also have your own YouTube channel. I do have my own YouTube channel that right now focuses on a lot of what we're doing here. Me going to places, talking to farmers, touring. Eventually at some point I'll get into more talking about, you know, what's happening back here in the garden. Again, a time thing. So I'm kind yeah. of looking to do more garden style stuff in January of this year. But for now, yeah, really focusing on the interviews with it's different awesome. farmers as they travel around. So really, this is not biochar, it's just charcoal. What's gonna make it biochar is when you start adding microbes to this, and I do that through compost. So what I'll eventually do is I'll go through, when I make my compost, every once in a while, I'll add a layer of the char. So the microbes from the soil and the compost get into the char. What this char does is it just has an amazing amount of surface area, it's very porous. And this is where minerals can collect and cation exchange can happen between roots and minerals in the soil. So that's the whole idea here is this is increasing the cation exchange capacity of soils. Some people will worry about like inoculating it either with a, a fish emulsion, saying it'll steal nutrients from your soil if you put it in raw. I don't overthink that. I'm not too worried about that. Uh, my soil fertility should be good. I'm not growing stuff as a commercial farmer, so it's not a huge worry of mine. But if you were, maybe you soak this in a compost tea or some sort of solution of fish emulsion to get nutrients into the char before you put it into the soil. Other than that, this is it. So that goes into the compost and we're done. Easy DOI. When this cools off and fully drains, what I'll do is lift this off and that bit of stuff that we raked underneath it at the beginning, that should also be char. And it should be really fine stuff because it tends to be a lot of these little seeds that have burned up. So I'll take the fine stuff, throw it right into the compost pile again, just getting more charcoal to add to the compost to turn into biochar. So yeah, man, I appreciate you letting me come out uh, you got you're definitely doing some important work. I mean you inspired me <laughs> uh, You know after hearing a lot of the the conversations that you were having and I would be sitting in my office and I'd be man This is I want to do <laughs> And you know, I think just hearing just normal folks just telling their story on how they started farming or uh, raising uh, pastured chickens and, and and just hearing that made me really think that hey, I could do that too, you know Maybe this is something that I, I, I should be doing. Yeah. So I appreciate that, man. Sure thing. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks for coming. <laughs> all right. I will leave links down to uh, Diego's website and all the podcasts that he's doing. It was so amazing to talk to him uh, and just to be here in Southern California talking to some people that have inspired me. But I appreciate you guys watching. My name is Jason from Sow the Land, and we'll see you guys next time.